Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane Kay. Today, I'll be giving my commentary of Seeking Sister Wife, Season 5, Episode 8, Seeking the Unexpected. What an episode. Danielle is pregnant. I couldn't believe it. My mouth was wide open. We'll address that in a bit. The episode opens with the Psycho Stalkers, the Ryans. It's been a few weeks since they stalked Stephanie. But the Ryans are still actively looking for a sister wife. They're looking on dating apps and they really look forward to living the lifestyle and reaping the benefits. Midlife crisis Justin wants to get his dick wet and Becky, his wife, is desperate for friends. Desperate for friends in a stage five clinger, single white female, I will stalk you kind of way. Justin is getting what's left of his haircut to look fresh for Yari, the new girl the Ryans are dating. Justin reveals it's a slow process, and he says the ratio of couples to single women on these polygamous dating apps is 100 to 1. So instead, they've opted for a regular dating app rather than a polygamous dating app. And that's where they met Yari. Justin was immediately dickmatized. Yari's beautiful, of course. And Becky is very optimistic, but she doesn't think Yari initially noticed that Justin was a polygamist looking for a second wife. Justin is a deceiver. He didn't tell Yari up front that he was a polygamist. So they went on their first date. They went out to eat after chatting online, after chatting on the phone. And Justin saved that crucial detail till the end of their first date. The lady, of course, was shocked. She had never heard of a polygamous lifestyle before. You know what? That's a red flag. This is a big red flag. It should be a red flag for Yari. If someone waits to get to know you first to drop a bomb and they really don't care about you enough to be honest up front about whatever it is, run, run. Justin withheld info, important information, till the end of the date. He wasted Yari's time, and he was trying to manipulate her into not rejecting him immediately upon hearing that news. Now, from day one, Justin is selfish. He puts his interests ahead of this new girl's interests. Yari should run. I feel it's a waste of Yari's time, but Yari might pursue Justin. Justin has no problem putting his own self-interest ahead of whatever woman he's dating. It's a red flag. Yari should have known from day one, way before the date, when they even went out to meet, that he was a polygamist. He should have posted it in big, bold letters. And instead, it seems he withheld that he was a polygamist looking for wife number two. And that's a huge red flag. If he's starting with the bullshit and withholding information now, imagine the future. Justin is at the barber. He wants to look good because Yari looks good. And Becky is sitting there. I feel like she's micromanaging the thing. She is staring intently at the barber, cutting her husband's hair. It's very micromanaging the vibe. She's telling him where it's not perfectly even before the guy is even done. I thought it was fucking annoying. If she isn't the one cutting her husband's hair and she can see that the barber isn't done yet, can't she just wait for him to finish his job before looking for the flaws? I would be annoyed if I had someone there, someone's wife there, staring at me, watching my every move. Wait a fucking second. Let me finish my job and then let me know if there's an issue with it. We learn that the barber is actually a polygamist himself. Becky mentions that Yari, she's a very fancy lady. She wears stilettos. She styles her hair. So Becky really wants Justin to look good. She wants him to put in a lot of effort to look his best to win Yari over. Justin has been talking to Yari for three weeks. The barber guy says he really doesn't think polygamy is too out of the box. Not for him, but he knows by society standards in general, yeah, polygamy would be more out of the box. But of course, he's a polygamist, so he doesn't mind, and he's cut other polygamists' hair. The barber has been living polygamy for six months, and he loves it. Becky is nervous for Justin's big date tonight, and Yari is going to have a lot of questions about polygamy to ask Justin. Justin is really excited, but after Stephanie, he is still feeling that heartbreak and that pain. He's not over it yet. He hopes today goes well, but he is keeping his expectations 
in check. Maybe Justin should pay Yari's gym membership. There's nothing like cash to foster that love and feeling. Next up are the Sherwoods, Shane and Ashley. And Shane is going to meet his friend Charlie for drinks. Shane feels that he can confide in Charlie. He can count on him. He can be honest with him. So Shane is going to be telling Charlie about his concerns with Sarah and Ashley. Shane says he got this bad feeling about Sarah. It was an awkward date meeting Sarah. And it was the first time he has seen Ashley openly flirt. He had mixed feelings about it. But he really liked seeing that his wife was happy. So when Sarah told Shane that she had just casually dated couples randomly and that she would maybe see them two or three times a year, that really gave him a lot of pause. It made him feel that Sarah wasn't looking for the same things that he and Ashley were. Sarah said that she was interested in them, but he feels like she's not ready to jump in and she doesn't want to take the steps to get to know them because she hasn't taken the initiative yet. Charlie feels that dating even just one person in monogamy is hard. So now with dating and adding in a new dynamic, a non-traditional one, adding on another person, there are a lot of feelings about it. And he feels if you want a healthy relationship and you want to do it in a polygamous lifestyle with double the feelings, double the issues, that that's going to be more than double the work. He himself couldn't do polygamy. He feels he'd be too jealous. But he says that there are some questions that Shane has and those questions definitely need answering. Shane really appreciates Charlie validating that Sarah needs to answer some questions because he feels like the bad guy sometimes. And he had a talk with Ashley and after his talk with Ashley, Ashley felt like maybe nobody would ever be good enough in Shane's eyes. And Shane reveals he fears that one of these women could steal Ashley away from him. Charlie feels that Shane's concerns are very normal and it's about commitment, it's about trust, it's about communication and talking through things when things get tough. Charlie gives good advice. Shane reveals that he and Ashley are going through this, pursuing polygamy and they're doing it so quickly. And that's because he was diagnosed with cancer last year, kidney cancer, and he had to have a surgery to remove the cancerous tissue, and the scan showed other areas on his other kidney to address. So for now, he's cancer-free, but it will come back, and he hasn't gone to do his checkup, and he knows they're going to have to treat it again, and this time, it might not be such a good outcome. This made me so sad. I when I saw Shane cry, I started crying. Shane seems like a really sweet guy. He just wants his wife to be happy. And now I understand why he wants to rush this, what the urgency is. And I think Shane really just wants to know that his wife has someone, that she isn't alone with two babies. God forbid if something were to happen to him. Now I fully get the urgency. Now I fully get why he wants to do this. And it might not be the best time. It might not be the most practical thing to do, but I understand why it gives him a sense of security and why it gives Ashley a sense of security. I think Shane wants to know that his wife has a support system. And as much as it hurts him to go through this, he's doing it to know that if anything happens to him, that his wife won't be alone, that she will be okay. I think it's very selfless and I think it's very hard. And I think it shows how much Shane cares about his wife. He doesn't want to leave her alone, even though this whole process of Ashley dating another woman probably rips him apart inside and it's hard for him to go through emotionally. Ultimately, Shane's priority is Ashley and Shane wants to make sure that Ashley is taken care of. And he's scared. He's scared for himself. He's scared for a situation, but he doesn't want to show that weakness in front of Ashley and that fear in front of Ashley. He wants to reassure her. I can't, you guys. The scene where Shane breaks down with his friend had me crying like a baby, and I wasn't expecting to have any emotions at all. From now on, I'm going to be rooting for Shane and Ashley, and I'm going to be rooting for this to work. Because all Shane wants is peace of mind that Ashley is okay if anything happens to him. Ashley is very scared about Shane's situation too. I would be terrified. I can now understand why Ashley is pursuing this so aggressively. She's scared. 
she wants to know she isn't alone. She has a small toddler and a baby on the way. I think she just wants to know that she won't be alone. And I think she also wants Shane to know that everything will be good so that he can have that peace of mind just in case. Shane really puts his wife ahead of himself. He prioritizes her, her well-being, and her emotions. He doesn't want to show her his fear about his cancer. He's doing that to make his wife feel more safe and more secure. And he is willing to put his heart through a blender to watch his wife fall for someone else as long as he knows she will have someone, she will be okay if worse comes to worse. At first, I wondered about Shane, and I'm going to admit this. I remember episode one, I worried maybe, possibly, that Shane could be controlling because he was picking Ashley's clothes, and it seemed to me like she needed validation from him about what she's going to wear, and she kept asking his opinion like she needed his approval, like it was up to him, and I mistook that, and I was wrong about that, completely wrong. Shane is a teddy bear. He loves his wife. He loves his kids. And this is his way of protecting his wife and of making sure she will be just fine. Imagine for a minute if a man like Cody Brown were in Shane's position. He would be wanting attention. He would be complaining that he's sick. He would be blaming everyone around him, treating everyone poorly just because he's sick, as if it's an excuse for that. Look at the way Shane handles his cancer situation versus the way Cody Brown handled the Rona. Shane seems like a loving guy. He seems like a kind guy, like a selfless guy. He communicates well, he's open, and he has his own fears. And I'm sure they're intense, but he seems to be putting his wife first at all costs. I admire that. I respect the fuck out of that. I hope everyone says a prayer or does a meditation or just sends good vibes, positive energy in whatever your way is. Send positive energy out for Shane into the universe. Life sucks. Life is short. Life is cruel. Life is unfair. But in the face of adversity, Shane turned to love. The love he has for his wife, the love he has for his kids and his family, and he is doing all he can to know he did everything he could while he could to know that his family is okay. A lesser man would play victim and scream and yell and spew toxicity and negativity. And look at how Shane is handling this. He turns to love rather than resentment, unlike some other people we know. That's a good dude. Shane's a good dude. We have seen many men on here who would blame the world and stew in anger in Shane's situation. Shane is awesome. Shane impressed me. The world needs more good. The world needs more Shanes. This guy is putting his wife's happiness and security ahead of his own jealousy because he loves her. He's an unselfish man doing a very difficult thing. And I know Shane has fears that some lady will steal Ashley away, but I think Ashley loves Shane and I think she is terrified and Ashley would never leave Shane. Shane and Ashley finding a wife together is giving them both a sense of purpose, a sense of peace of mind, and now I'm rooting for them all the way. Once I'm brought to tears, that's it, and I don't easily break down like that, but this one got to me. Next up are the Jim Jones wannabe and the gum stuck to his shoe he can't shake, Danielle, the woman who is supposed to be the wife and the mother of his kids with the baby on the way. This is the mother of all clusterfucks. It really is. It's been two months since Garrick proposed to Natalia. Six weeks ago, Garrick took off for Brazil to bang Natalia as Danielle stayed behind and took care of her kids. And Danielle is packing to go to Rio. When the Merrifields got back from Mexico, Danielle felt like Natalia's focus shifted completely. Her communication with Danielle wasn't the same. She ignored Danielle's messages. She would read them without responding. And Danielle and Garrick fought over it. And now Garrick and Natalia are together in Brazil. They're planning a wedding. And they're going to be applying for the marriage visa instead of the K-1. Danielle looks miserable. And in a little, we're going to find out why. I already dropped it. You've already seen it. She's pregnant, guys. 
She explains that she and Garrick have spoken about the kids. They've spoken about work. They've only spoken about the things they have to communicate about. But they needed time apart to soul search and seek things out with the Lord. And that's according to Danielle, to seek things out with the Lord and soul search. If there is some invisible force in the sky, some supernatural power looking down, seeing all things, then what Lord would want Danielle to be unhappy with a man who doesn't love, value, and respect her? The Lord would want Danielle to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be with a man who loves her, who values her, who respects her as his equal. I doubt the Lord wants Danielle unhappy, chasing this tool with the SKIs and the Jim Jones cult vibes to Brazil to watch him marry this other woman and prioritize this woman as he treats her like a second-class citizen as the mother of his kids with a baby on the way. The Lord doesn't want this. That feeling Danielle has had in her gut, that's God, in my opinion, her God, telling her, go, leave. Get the fuck out. But if God exists, it's not a God who wants a woman to rip herself apart to participate in some fuckery like this just to stay in a situation where she isn't valued, happy, or wanted. Garrick doesn't give a fuck. He could take Danielle or he could leave her. It doesn't matter to him. He treats her like he would rather leave her, to be honest. Doesn't Danielle think her God wants her to have someone who loves and values her the way that she loves and values them? I doubt God is up there, if they're up there, happy to see Garrick getting his dick wet as Danielle is miserable at home, parenting her kids, wishing her husband paid her attention as she cries herself to sleep. Danielle could find a guy who is all about her. She has love to give. She would easily find a guy who is a real man who accepts her as she is, who accepts her kids, who loves her kids, and who shows them how men act, how a man treats his wife. Because the kids, sure as shit, aren't learning that from Garrick. I had enough of this. This Garrick bullshit is disgusting. Garrick makes my skin crawl. Samantha is over helping Danielle pack. Garrick and Danielle have been having a really hard time. Their relationship has been very rocky and Samantha knows what's up. Danielle tells Samantha that there are going to be some big changes, big changes like a baby on the way. Danielle lets Samantha know she isn't very excited about going to this wedding. She doesn't want to go to Brazil. Samantha is really worried because she knows how rocky Danielle and Garrick have been. And there were nights when Garrick would come over and sleep at her house. It's gotten that bad. Samantha has never seen things this bad between Danielle and Garrick. And Danielle drops the big news that she is pregnant. Garrick can't be a good father to the two kids he has. He can't be a great husband to his wife and the mother of his kids. Why have more kids? Samantha looks horrified. She is shocked at this news. I'm shocked at the news. You know, at the beginning of the season, I thought Danielle maybe got a boob job or maybe she got a good push-up bra, but no, she is preggers. And there's Garrick Jr. growing inside her as we speak. The world needs less Garricks, definitely less Garricks. Danielle hasn't told Garrick the news yet. It wasn't a planned pregnancy, of course, and Danielle really wasn't expecting it. Danielle knows that when Garrick left, she and Garrick weren't in the best place. That's why he left for so long. And this break from Garrick is the longest she and Garrick have ever been apart in their whole marriage, in their whole relationship. So Danielle has had the realization that she could be a single parent. At this point, she doesn't know if she and Garrick will stay together. Samantha, of course, is very concerned about the situation, and she feels like if she were in Danielle's shoes, home alone and pregnant, she would want her husband there by her side. She is concerned that Garrick will stay in Brazil and Danielle will be left home alone with a newborn and her two other kids and with no one. So Samantha hopes the baby will bring them together. She hopes they will work it out. A baby isn't a good solution to bring two people together. What a nightmare. It's good to be positive, but I don't think the baby's going to change shit.
If I were Danielle, I would take this pregnancy as the final straw to say, it's time for me to go. She has her support system. She has resources. She can leave. She can start her life fresh. She can find someone who loves her the way she deserves, who respects her the way she deserves. Because Garrick will never be it. And she allows it. And she allows it. And as long as she allows it, Garrick will continue. And she will continue to feel bad. No human being can live like that for the rest of their life. She already has a legal divorce. Let's hope Garrick signs a prenup with the new wife. But she needs to get the fuck out of there. If I were her, I would be getting the fuck out of there. Understandably, Danielle is really upset. And on top of the fact that she is pregnant, she is supposed to be going to Brazil to witness Garrick and Natalia's wedding. And it's supposed to happen this weekend. So Danielle doesn't know how Garrick's going to feel about the news. She knows what a fragile state their relationship is in. So Danielle doesn't know if their relationship will recover. Natalia has barely talked to Danielle. And Danielle doesn't know why. She knows that Natalia really wants to enjoy her time with Garrick. Danielle doesn't know where Natalia is at with this situation. But she says it doesn't feel like she wants her at the wedding. And she wonders if Natalia wants a sisterhood at all. Danielle has lots of mixed feelings on it, but she feels Natalia is selfish and that Natalia wants Garrick to herself. She feels like a third wheel in the situation and she will feel like if she goes to the wedding, she will be invading their wedding and she really feels like an outsider. She doesn't feel like a part of it. Going to this wedding, pregnant, knowing how you feel, knowing how you've been treated, knowing what you're about to witness, knowing there's no prenup in place, I would be pissed off. I wouldn't want to fucking be there. That would be like walking through your own version of hell in your real life, in reality. I would want nothing to do with that. Luckily, Danielle doesn't go. Or she says she's not going to go. We'll see what happens. Samantha points out that Natalia's commitment isn't just to Garrick. It's supposed to be to Danielle. It's also supposed to be to their boys. And Danielle says it doesn't feel like Natalia is making the commitment to her. And Samantha is wondering if Natalia wants to take Garrick away. Danielle's impression is that Natalia maybe thought that she and Garrick would ultimately separate. She knew already that Garrick and Danielle were very rocky. And Danielle feels like maybe Natalia assumed that somewhere along the line, she and Garrick would break up eventually. So Danielle isn't okay and she feels like an outsider. What a fucking nightmare. What a nightmare. Danielle is scared. And it's a scary realization that after so long with Garrick, there is a very real possibility that she could be doing this on her own and she knows it's not a great time for her to be pregnant. Imagine how this feels for Danielle, the stress of being pregnant, all of the emotions, plus working, plus being a parent to two kids alone as your husband is in Brazil banging Natalia. Then having to go to Brazil to attend the wedding and having to break the pregnancy news, knowing it's the worst possible time for this for everyone involved. This is Danielle's husband of decades, the father of her kids, and she doesn't feel she can talk to him. She isn't secure in the fact that he will be there for her, that he will support her, that he will prioritize her, and the fact that she is carrying his third child. That's a lot on one person. That's a lot of stress. That's a lot of emotions on one person. That is the definition of an emotional roller coaster like no other. How sad is it that you have been married to this man for decades? You lived most of your lives together. You have a family together and you get pregnant and you can't be sure this man will have your back and prioritize you. It should be a given that Garrick will be there. It should be a given that Garrick will drop everything to be by Danielle's side. Danielle has been with Garrick for decades and she doesn't already automatically know intuitively in her heart and in her mind, this guy, her husband, the father of her kids will be there by your side. It's not guaranteed that he'll be there. She knows Garrick might actually have her do this all alone. She knows he could easily pick Natalia over her and that very likely it could go that way. He will pick Natalia over his unborn child. 
What does that say about Garrick and Garrick's character? That Danielle doesn't have faith that Garrick will be there for her. What does that say about the type of man Garrick is? Danielle knows Garrick inside and out. She's been his wife for decades. And she knows she can't count on him. She can't count on her husband. It's not a given that he'll be there for her during this pregnancy. He knows there's a possibility that Garrick might pick pussy over her as his wife carrying his child after she sacrificed decades of her life with him. Garrick, in my opinion, is a shit human. If Danielle, as the wife, as the mother of his two kids with a baby on the way, has to wonder if Garrick will be there, if Garrick will choose her. That says everything we need to know about piece of shit Garrick. Everything. It's not a sure thing that Garrick will pick her. And Danielle knows that. And this should be a given. It's not even a question or a choice for most people. For most men. What does that behavior remind you of? Danielle isn't sure that Garrick is going to prioritize her and the baby. He's not going to run from Brazil, from banging Natalia to be by your side when he finds out she's pregnant. What does that remind you of? That's like when Cody Brown decided not to go to his daughter's major surgery. We have the same type of fuckery and the same type of selfish, narcissistic behavior here with selfish men, with big egos who are insecure on the inside, who don't prioritize the people in their lives properly. They prioritize themselves first. In Garrick's situation, he prioritizes his dick. In the end, the loser is Garrick. He's going to end up old and alone, and I hope Danielle has their baby if she wants to. I'm sure for her, with all of the God stuff and the drinking of the Kool-Aid, she doesn't have a choice. She has to keep the baby, probably, and that's her choice, and that's a very personal choice. But I hope, regardless of what she chooses, that she leaves Garrick and that she finds a man who loves her as much as she loves him. This woman will rip her heart to oblivion to keep Garrick, to keep her family together, even if it goes against all of the common sense in the world. She loves Garrick. She loves even when it is detrimental to her and her well-being. I hope one day Danielle finds a man who will love her and her kids the way they all deserve to be loved. And I think if their version of God exists, that's what he would want. What a clusterfuck. I can't say that enough. I frankly don't believe Danielle telling Garrick she is pregnant will have any effect on Garrick at all or his priorities. He will probably be very annoyed that it interferes with his sexy time with Natalia. He's not going to run to be by Danielle's side. I mean, I hope I'm wrong about Garrick. I hope Garrick gets his head out of his ass, that he prioritizes Danielle, that he is stoked about this baby, and that he appreciates the family he already has. But I think Garrick is hooked on the power of the pussy, and that's all he cares about. He's selfish, and I think even amidst the pregnancy news, he will put his dick first. I think if we saw Natalia pregnant, we would be seeing a whole different reaction from Garrick. But I guess we'll see. Next up are the Davises. Danielle confirmed with her sister wives that she is ready to start dating again. So now they're going to be letting Nick know. Let the dating commence and let's smash Danielle's heart. Smash, smash, smash. Because she can smile and say she's okay with this all she wants, but she is not. Nick explains a little bit about how dating works in his family. And basically, his current wives will seek out the potential sister wives. It won't be him. So Danielle lets everybody know what she wants to do to be okay with this dating thing is she wants to make sure that they take time to debrief after dates and before dates, that they have group discussions. And Nick is worried that Danielle wasn't really certain about being with them. And now he realizes Danielle is actually certain about being with them, but she is uncertain about who else would be coming in and about the dating thing. So Nick really wants to work through it with Danielle. Danielle feels that dating is nerve wracking. She says there's a lot on the line and she would potentially be getting legally married to this woman, 
the way April and Jennifer are legally married to each other. So there is a lot at stake, especially for Danielle. Nick asks Danielle if she is sure about this dating thing. And Danielle says she is sure. And she says she's ready to get married. She's ready to have a wife of her own. And she feels if someone else is also meant to be in the family, she wants them to be there with all of them. I don't think Danielle is ready at all. I don't truly believe she wants this at all. I think she left, she got that apartment, and she should have stuck to her guns. I think that was probably the best decision of Danielle's life so far, most likely. I think the family manipulated Danielle by talking about how hurt they were with her leaving, by being emotional, by mentioning that the kids were upset, mentioning that she is their family. She left them, her family. She left her family behind, making them feel she did them wrong. She abandoned them. And that manipulated Danielle into going back and into agreeing to dating and also legally marrying the potential sister wife, even though we all know she still has the same issues with the dating that she had before. She is just saying she's okay with it now, in my opinion, because she's young, she's naive, and I think she just really wants to belong. She wants to have a family. She wants to feel loved. She wants to matter. And these people make her feel like they love her, like they can't live without her. When, you know, if she said the truth right here, if Danielle said, I'm not okay with dating, if she said it here and now, loud, I'm not okay with dating, they would not hesitate to drop her to continue dating. I think the dating and the wife factory and the setup in this family is something Nick and his wives will insist on. And Danielle knows if she wants to keep her place where she feels she belongs, she has to accept dating. She has to accept what she isn't okay with at all. The Davis family manipulated Danielle. They guilt-tripped her back in. They made Danielle feel bad for leaving as if she wronged them just because she wanted space. If the Davis family really loved her, they wouldn't be bringing up dating so soon and pressuring her. They would be telling her to take all the time she needs with empathy and understanding. If they had to choose Danielle or dating, I think the Davis family would discard Danielle to continue dating, to continue adding on wives. And I think they make Danielle feel selfish for saying no. They make her feel selfish for keeping them from doing the dating and expanding their family. I think Danielle has a lot of love to give. She can find a relationship where she belongs, where she is enough, where she doesn't have to put up with dating other women if she isn't okay with it. Danielle can find a relationship where if she isn't okay with it, she is important enough, she matters enough, she's loved enough that the other person would stop dating and be content with her. Does Danielle matter to the Davis family more or less than them dating does? Danielle is going to get herself stuck in a situation she never wanted that she knew wasn't right for her. She got that apartment because she listened to her gut and these people sucked her back in. I don't think Danielle is a priority to them, not over dating. It doesn't matter what words Danielle says. I think they all know that Danielle isn't comfortable and they don't mind because she said the right words. They don't mind that Danielle is just accepting dating so she doesn't feel selfish or like she's a barrier to the family expanding. But we all know this is not really what she wants at all. And I think Danielle knows if she says no to dating, then she'll be out and she doesn't want to be out. She knows they won't pick her over expanding the family. They won't pick her over dating. But if they all love her so much, if Danielle is that integral to their family, if she matters so much, then why not stop dating when they know Danielle isn't comfortable with it? Danielle really means that much to all of them. Why not stop? Dating means more to these people. Building their cult means more to these people. This isn't about Danielle at all. This is about guilting Danielle into conforming. And now she is going to be stuck with a divorce by 25 if she doesn't listen to that nagging pang in her gut telling her, get out, get out, get the fuck out. She is going to wish she kept that apartment. There are decisions you make in life. There are opportunities you don't take that you will regret over the years where you're going to be looking back, wishing you listened to that intuition, 
wishing you chose A instead of B. And usually whatever that thing is that you regret, if you had just gone with your gut, if you had just listened, that regret wouldn't be there. And this will be that for Danielle, in my opinion. But you live and you learn. The Davises are older. They know better. They know how young Danielle is. They know that she's uncomfortable with this. They know she is just being agreeable. And yet they are pushing forward and they're going through with this. Dating means more to them. They don't really give a fuck about Danielle. If they did, they wouldn't be pushing dating. Danielle will live and learn, but she really is going to regret not keeping that apartment. Danielle says she's ready for dating, but during her confessional scene alone, she reveals that although she's playing it cool with the dating, she is nervous about this. She isn't sure how it will turn out, and she doesn't want the Davises to know that she is so terrified of what could potentially happen with this situation. Danielle doesn't feel like she can be honest with her sister wives or with her husband, and that's a huge red flag. Danielle doesn't reveal that she is worried about this, that she's terrified. She doesn't tell her sister wives. She doesn't tell Nick. She pretends she's totally cool with this. And the sister wives and Nick toast to turning on their dating profile as Danielle looks horrified. I would say run Danielle run. She doesn't feel comfortable communicating. And I think she knows it's three against one. And those three really want to do dating. And I think she feels pressure. And I think the three other people around her make her feel selfish for not wanting to expand the family the way they do. So she feels she has to quiet her voice in order to stay there and have that belonging that she thinks she needs. Nick knows Danielle isn't ready for dating. Nick is excited about finding a wife for Danielle, but he admits he has concerns that Danielle isn't really ready to start dating. He realizes she might just be saying it to be agreeable. If Nick knows before they start dating that Danielle is young and she's just trying to go with the flow and that she really isn't being honest with her feelings. She doesn't feel comfortable. Yet he and his other two wives will push it and be enthusiastic about this dating, knowing Danielle is just going through the motions and she'll have to marry this woman legally. Why not just be real? If they really love Danielle and they know she's putting on a show, why not just admit, we know you aren't ready yet to date? We'll wait. Or do you think you might ever be okay with this and have those kind of conversations? If they really love her and they already know she's putting on a show, why not just be real? Instead, they will use Danielle being naive, Danielle wanting to please everyone, Danielle wanting to be agreeable as an excuse to just ignore what they already know is the reality of the situation for Danielle to just do what they want in dates since she said the right words. And they're going to push Danielle into marrying this woman knowing Danielle underneath it all isn't okay with this. And this is gross because it's a lot of pressure for Danielle. And Nick knows she isn't ready. He knows they sucked her back in and he knows he will proceed with dating regardless. No one has the balls. No one has the consciousness to tell Danielle, listen, you aren't ready to date. We want to date. You don't want to date. And we love you, but we love dating more. Because ultimately, whether Danielle is okay with this or not, whether they lose Danielle or not, all these people give a fuck about is dating and creating the next married couple to add on to their family, their cultish family. The same issues that were there before Danielle left and got the apartment are all still there. There is nothing different now at all. Nothing will change once the dating progresses. It's just going to get worse, except Danielle will be on the roller coaster ride of her life, wishing for that apartment she gave up. Next up are the Sherwoods. Shane is relieved to have had that talk with Charlie. He feels better. He feels like he got a lot off his chest. Normally, Ashley is Shane's confidant, but he likes having friends to talk to, especially about Sarah, since he and Ashley aren't on the same page about Sarah. Shane and Ashley talk a little bit, and Shane tells Ashley how he cried in front of his friend. He cried in front of another man for the first time ever, and he knows he's pushed his cancer screenings off, but now he's decided he wants to go soon, 
And Shane lets Ashley know he recognizes that she has a lot to deal with. She has to deal with his cancer stuff and with dating a potential sister or wife and with being pregnant and taking care of a very little kid. And he knows even though it's a lot for him, it's a lot for her too. And Ashley is terrified for Shane. Ashley feels really good about Sarah. So they're going to be seeing her again and they want to have a serious conversation with her about where things stand. Ashley is really optimistic about Sarah but Shane has a lot of hesitation. He still wants to make sure that Sarah checks all of the boxes in his mind so that he can feel confident that Ashley has someone to love and care for her who she can be herself around. I love that Shane seems to really love Ashley completely as she is all the way. He accepts her as she is. He loves her as she is. And his main concern is finding someone Ashley can be herself with. That's beautiful. A lot of times people marry people or they get in relationships and they date people and they expect things to change in the other person. They expect when they marry them, things will change. They marry the person with the expectation that the person will change. They marry the person they think that you can be, the person they see you becoming, not who you are. And that's not the case with Shane and Ashley. Shane definitely loves Ashley as she is, and he wants her to always be herself. And that's a very smart thing for him to prioritize. And it's a smart thing to prioritize in another partner in general. And it really shows just how much Shane loves his wife. The world needs more Shanes and less Garricks. Back to the psycho stalkers, the Ryans. Tonight is the big date with Yari. Becky warns Justin to wow her. She feels that Justin can dazzle Yari by pulling out her chair. I guess these two brainiacs figured stalking Yari's gym and paying her membership wasn't the way to go this time to sweeten things. This time, they are going for subtle and sophisticated, and Becky wants Justin to pull out Yari's chair. Maybe that'll seal the deal. Becky won't be hopping fences just yet, creeping in the windows, but if Yari's a good fit, it might be Yari's lucky day. There's nothing that says I love you better than a good stock, better than a good showing up at the house, unannounced, hopping that fence, popping that garage door, scoping out the gym, paying that gym membership. If Yari wants the special treatment Stephanie style, if she wants to be stuck to Helen back, I have a feeling it's coming soon. One day the Ryans are going to stalk the wrong one and this is going to end up in a 48 hours type of situation. It wouldn't surprise me. Becky's excited about this opportunity with Justin and Yari and if the date goes well, then eventually Becky will meet her. Justin complains that Yari isn't going to let him pick her up at her house. She makes it clear that she always meets her dates in public places. What a smart lady. Don't let this man know your address. Don't let him know where your gym is at. Becky has hopes that Yari will at least let Justin escort her to her car at the end of the night. Justin gives me the creeps. He has empty eyes. He's very weird looking. He has a weird fake tan. He has really odd ears. And just imagine Justin, that face, an inch from your face, in a bed. Those eyes looking into yours. And tell me you don't feel your skin crawl, and like you want to run. Justin is so weird. And there's weird and quirky in the best way and weird and quirky in a no way. And Justin is a no way. He's desperate and his wife is really creepy along with him. It's not the polygamy that skews me out with these two. It's just them in general. Something is way off. They scream thirst. They scream desperation. And when they're on my TV screen, my internal alert, my intuition screams, alert, 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 run. Becky warns Justin, no intimacy allowed, no sex, even if Yari wants to. Even if she wants to, even if she initiates, Justin has to say no. So he asks Becky, well, what if I get drunk? And Becky tells Justin he doesn't drink, but Becky is okay with a little kiss. The Ryans aren't going to make the same mistakes as they did with Stephanie. They went all the way and they thought everyone in that situation was committed. And now look. So Becky really wants to take this slow and she really wants to make sure everyone is committed.
Apparently, when Yari matched with Justin, she didn't take the time to read his profile. She didn't read it at all. Did she not read it at all, or did Justin fail to mention the pertinent information in his profile? Look at Justin. Not to be rude, but no one in their right mind would choose him just based on his picture. So at the end of the first day, Justin broke the news that he has a wife, that he's a polygamist looking for a second wife. Yari was shocked by the news, but she wanted to see him again. And since that date, Yari and Justin haven't discussed polygamy at all. When Yari agreed to a second date, Justin and Becky were very surprised that Yari was open-minded, that she seemed accepting of the idea of polygamy, even though she had never heard of that lifestyle ever before. Yari's first question when she goes out on her first date is usually if the guy lives by himself or with somebody else. What late 40s, early 50s year old man is going to have roommates or worse? I wonder how many on these dating apps live in their mother's basements. Justin tells Yari that he told Becky about her. Justin asks Yari if she is open to dating him as a polygamist. Yari's considering it. She's thinking about it, but it's new for her. And she's really worried about Becky. She wonders if Becky is actually okay with this. And Justin says he doesn't keep any secrets. Yari mentions that it's a problem when people aren't honest from the beginning. Of course, Justin wasn't honest from the beginning with her. And Justin wonders if Yari has dealt with infidelity in her past, and he knows he wasn't honest with her from the start, so he feels moving forward, he really wants to be honest and upfront with her. Yari really wants to know what Justin expects as far as dating. Is it going to be just he and her, or is it going to be the three of them? Justin doesn't care either way as long as his dick gets wet. He says he wants to figure it out as they go. He really feels he's vibing with Yari, but until Yari meets Becky, they won't know if there is a future there. All three of them have to vibe together for this to work. Yari worries if it's a problem for Justin to go out alone with her. And Justin says Becky isn't jealous, not at all. Somehow, I doubt that. Justin feels Yari won't understand polygamy until she meets Becky. Yari doesn't know what Justin expects, if he expects all three of them to be together or if it's just going to be she and him, and she thinks it's better when men tell you the truth. I think she's throwing out honesty and truth because she knows that Justin wasn't honest with her till the end of their first date, and it's kind of under her skin. And Justin doesn't seem to really be taking full accountability for that, in my opinion. And if he already withheld information before they went on the first date, and he did that because he felt if Yari met him, if Yari got to know him before he dropped the news that it might work better in his favor, that shows how manipulative he is. That shows that he really doesn't have Yari's best interests at heart. He has his own interests at heart. If he withheld from the start, he's going to withhold again. He's not going to just tell the truth. He's not going to just always be honest. Justin is gross. He can't wait to try to walk Yari to her car to touch her and be all up on her. You know what? Yari's gorgeous. She can do way better than Justin. She can find a man that is just as attractive as she is, who is also honest with her from day one. The fact that Justin didn't tell Yari till the end of the first date would be a deal breaker for me. That would be it. He withheld once about integral info day one. So I would be asking myself, what else is he willing to hide just to gain favor? Now, Justin asks Yari if he gets a kiss. How desperate is this man? He's leaning all over her. He looks disgusting and he looks like he's probably a shit kisser. He looks like a bad kisser. I just... Bleh. He whispers that nobody is looking. Nobody's looking. It's okay. You can kiss me. Yeah, nobody's looking. Just the TLC cameras and the whole viewing audience. But nobody's looking. Yari is laughing. She's looking down. She's uncomfortable. And she tells Justin, thank you for your time as she's looking down. And you can tell he's trying to access her face. And Justin asks, that's it? And he tries for a kiss. Gross. I would be so turned off at this point. I would be annoyed that this guy is desperate 
begging for affection and trying to force a kiss when I'm obviously not fully into it. I would have been like, fuck off. I'll kiss you if I want to and when I want to. Fuck all the way off. Justin seems like the type of guy who pays for a woman's dinner and then he expects that he is then entitled to their affection. I don't like him. I just don't like him. Yari gives Justin a quick peck and he complains, no tongue, as he rolls his eyes that that is all he got. What an ungrateful fuck. This guy has zero game. He's not smooth at all and he thinks he is and that's what's so entertaining about watching him. Yari says that was her first kiss with Justin and she says it was and then she pauses a minute to find the words and she says it was good but it didn't look like it was good and she didn't look like she felt it and she didn't look like she felt it was good at all. She wasn't feeling a spark in my opinion. Yari admits that all she could think about was Becky and she wonders how this will work if she prefers to have Justin for herself. She says Justin has to decide and they have to see what happens in the future. Plot twist! Is Yari going to try and steal Justin away from Becky? How soon will Justin start dropping financial incentives for this relationship to happen, I wonder? Back to the Merrifields, Garrick FaceTimes Danielle. He's relaxed. He talks about just getting back from the beach. Garrick and Danielle haven't connected for five to six weeks. She found out she was pregnant without Garrick there, and she thinks Garrick is going to be surprised by the pregnancy just like she was. She doesn't know what's going to happen between she and Garrick. The relationship is rocky, but she doesn't want to go to Rio. She doesn't want to go to the wedding. Natalia is out during this FaceTime call. She's dress shopping. Garrick says it's been crazy. It's been difficult. He complains that there are lots of loopholes. There's lots of bureaucracy. And he wants to set a wedding date soon. They were supposed to get married this weekend. Danielle expresses to Garrick that it doesn't seem like Natalia wants her there at the wedding. She doesn't think she'll come. And Garrick tells Danielle that once she gets there, maybe things will get better. Danielle really doesn't feel like Natalia wants her there, and things have been really bad with Garrick. So Danielle is very nervous about Garrick and Natalia's reaction to the pregnancy. She wants this to be really happy, exciting news, but it doesn't feel that way. Danielle tells Garrick the news that she's pregnant, and Garrick, his face is on freeze. He doesn't change his expression for like 30 seconds on his face. There's no smile, no nothing, just doom in his eyes. He looks like he just got a whiff of some shit. That's his expression when Danielle reveals, I'm pregnant. Garrick is silent for a while, and then he says, oh, and then he laughs, and he's speechless, and he says, it's a surprise, and then he reverts to God. He says, children are a blessing from God. It's a blessing. He didn't expect it. And Danielle is in tears, and she tells Garrick she feels overwhelmed. She tells him she can't make this trip. She feels awkward. She feels like she's going to be in the background. She's going to feel like a third wheel there at the wedding. Garrick thinks, yeah, Danielle would feel like a third wheel, but he would love her to be a part of it. And if she didn't come, Garrick fears that would hurt Natalia's feelings. Danielle has just told Garrick she is pregnant, and Garrick's main concern is Natalia's feelings. Danielle is in tears, and she makes it clear to Garrick she can't come. She isn't going. Even after learning Danielle is pregnant, he prioritizes Natalia's feelings, and he tries to push Danielle to come anyway. How selfish is this man? Garrick shows no concern for Danielle or for the baby or for Danielle's emotional well-being. He is more concerned that Natalia might feel slighted if Danielle doesn't attend the wedding. His main concern is himself and Natalia. Garrick's reaction isn't, oh, let me come home. I'm going to come home tomorrow at the earliest flight. No, no, no. He hasn't asked Danielle, do you need me? Should I come? 
he seems to have more of an emotional response over Danielle not coming and possibly upsetting Natalia when he should be telling Danielle, don't come, it's too much for you, stay home, stay healthy, keep the baby healthy, and I'm coming home. Instead, it's, yeah, you'll be a third wheel, but drag your pregnant ass across the world so Natalia isn't butthurt, you didn't come. WTF! What about the baby Danielle is carrying? Where is Garrick's concern for that? Garrick wants to inconvenience and overwhelm Danielle and his baby that's still cooking, just so Natalia isn't disappointed at their wedding. When Natalia doesn't give a fuck. How do you guys think Natalia will react to the baby news? Let me know in the comments how you think Natalia will react. Every time I think we've reached the pinnacle of the clusterfuck with the Merrifields, it just gets worse. Garrick sees that Danielle is emotional, and he really doesn't try to do anything to reassure Danielle or comfort her. He lets her know he'll call Danielle tomorrow. He tells Danielle he loves her, that she is special, and that he is really excited for the baby. If Garrick loves Danielle and she is so special, he would be flying home immediately and doing this wedding another time. His pregnant wife is home alone, raising two kids with a baby growing inside her. And all he can do is offer, I love you. You're special. I'm excited. Get the fuck out. Garrick did exactly what I thought he would. He made a face like fuck no when he heard the news. He knew he couldn't admit that he wasn't happy. So then he mentioned God and blessings. But Garrick isn't happy. Danielle isn't happy. And I'm going to be frank. If I were in her shoes, and this is a very personal thing, but I probably would just get a shmishmorshman. But I am sure in Danielle's faith, she can't even consider that as an option. And depending on how much worse the relationship with Garrick gets, this pregnancy could really be detrimental to Danielle. It could really depress her. She already feels like an outsider with her own husband. She already feels like a third wheel with Garrick and Natalia, and she has two other kids to raise. This could really depress her and bring her down and put her in her very fragile emotional state. This is going to be hell for Danielle. This is going to be a hell she doesn't deserve. I just feel bad for the baby, and I think mentally this is too much for Danielle. Garrick should cut the shit and come home. Danielle is crying like this on camera. So imagine how much she suffers emotionally in her daily private life with Garrick's behavior and the way he treats her. There's a part of me that feels bad for Danielle, even though in some way she did bring these things on herself, but she has a support system. She can leave. She can choose to not have the baby. She can leave and have the baby. But this woman is going to feel worse and worse emotionally until she cuts Garrick out of her life. Between Danielle and her family, they can all support each other and they can get Danielle out of the situation and on her own. I know the parents live at Garrick's house and the brother works with Garrick, but is it all worth the way Garrick treats Danielle and the detrimental effects that has on Danielle's emotional well-being? I know Danielle knows that she's miserable. She knows this is wrong. She knows Garrick doesn't love and respect her. I seriously feel like she is indoctrinated with Garrick's cult speak and Kool-Aid on God. And I think part of her is afraid of change or she's afraid if she leaves, Garrick won't be involved with his kids. If Garrick is already spending six weeks away so nonchalantly to get some ass, six weeks away from his kids just to go get some ass, he isn't that much of a family man and a father to begin with. He really isn't there the way a father should be or the way a man should be. No man should make a woman feel this bad about herself and no woman should accept it either. Now, Danielle is pregnant and this should be the light that wakes her up to the point where she excises the tumor that is Garrick from her life. This is not what God wants. Danielle has money, she has resources, she has a support system, she has a baby on the way. And she shouldn't waste a second more accepting this. If she doesn't get out of this now, she's going to have the baby and be miserable for a decade or more before she finally has the nerve 
to be done with Garrick. What is she holding on to? No one is meant to be this miserable. Life is short. Life is short. If something makes you this miserable, it's not for you. Garrick is a ghost to begin with. He isn't there. He isn't present. His priority is himself and his dick and whatever new woman he gets to bone. That's it. He already isn't there. So what is Danielle holding on to? Garrick's ghost. Maybe the memories of the past. Who Garrick was in the past. But the past is gone and clinging to a ghost will only make Danielle crazy. This is not what God wants. Garrick doesn't care if Danielle stays or goes. She's legally divorced from him. This is on Danielle now, and now is the time to leave. Garrick advises a teary Danielle to focus on the baby, to focus on the blessing that God just did for them. If Garrick gave a fuck about Danielle, he wouldn't be telling her to focus on God and the blessing. He would be telling her, my ass is coming home. I'll be home as soon as possible. The first flight out, I'll be there. That's what would be happening. Danielle explains that God put she and Garrick together. He never changed it. And God told Garrick and Danielle to be together. And that was one of the most powerful things in her life. Powerful spiritual things when that happened between she and Garrick. And Danielle says she needs to be assured of Garrick so that she and Garrick can be strong together. So they can be a united front with everything that they do in their lives. And they haven't been united. Guess what? A baby on the way and a brand new wife and a brand new marriage for Garrick isn't the way to achieve that unity. If I were Danielle, I would make sure that prenup is in place because she is not a legal wife. Danielle is having Garrick's third child and his new legal wife will have a right to everything if shit hits the fan. It's so weird. Danielle and Garrick talk about God in a culty delusional way. This testimony, that feeling, God spoke to them, this and that. Yet Garrick puts his dick above his God. And Danielle follows Garrick around like he is her God. And they seem to share the same delusions about God. They're both drinking that Kool-Aid. Yet none of what they're doing in their actions indicates that God or some higher power is actually in all of this. Danielle winded up pregnant at the worst time. She's suffering big time. Garrick only cares about his dick. If that man cared about God and the blessing he claims God gave him in Danielle, he would be running to be by her side. He couldn't get there fast enough to be there with her as she goes through this. What should be good and happy, a pregnancy, becomes a burden, a deeply emotional difficulty to suffer through amidst Danielle and Garrick's rocky relationship as Garrick is marrying someone else. And what God considers bad, a commandment, adultery, marrying multiple wives, that becomes good, at least in Garrick's eyes. And he uses God to justify pleasing himself, doing that selfish evil. This is like the upside down with these people. If Garrick was really all about God, he wouldn't be saying, I'll call you tomorrow. Oh, what a blessing. Just think about that blessing and think about God as a way to placate Danielle, who is in tears over this unplanned pregnancy. He would be saying, I'll book a ticket. I'll fly back tomorrow. I didn't hear one. I know this is hard for you. Do you need anything? Oh, maybe I should come home. He said nothing a loving husband or a man of God would say. Instead, I heard, oh yeah, yeah, you'll be the third wheel. Yeah, you're pregnant, but if you don't come, Natalia might feel bad. That's all we heard, and crickets, and some BS, his culty speak, cool lady, God stuff. The whole thing is fucked. That does it for this episode. I'll be back next week with the next episode of Seeking Sister Wife, Season 5, Episode 9, Seeking a Silver Lining. Thanks for listening. I'll see you soon. Bye.